Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As chair of the Capital Investments Committee, Senator David Senjum has taken the if you build it, they will come approach to tackling problems of mental illness and recidivism among the prison population. He has sponsored legislation to provide housing and services to former inmates and to develop regional behavioral health crisis programs throughout the state. He now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Good to be here. With the proposed legislation that you talked about in Capital Investments Committee yesterday and the Unlocking Opportunities Grant Program, you're demonstrating an increased commitment to community-based programs to help individuals and families. Why? Well, Shannon, uh, the bills that we had before capital investment yesterday had to do with the uh, mental illness and how we deal with that across Minnesota. And I'll be honest, uh, there's a lot of good efforts. I don't diminish those. But to, frankly, we need to do a lot better. It is, a, it is, we're at crisis proportions, I think, in terms of our ability to, to, to manage the, that population. It seems to be an ever-growing population. And so why did I get interested in this? Uh, because I, I grew up with mental illness. It just the way it was uh, a long time ago, albeit. But, uh, you know, as I grew up in a little town of Hayfield, Minnesota, uh, uh, parents, both my parents uh, suffered from schizophrenia. Uh, Dad committed suicide when I was 12 years old. That's not easy for a young boy. And a couple uh, sisters uh, lived in a little town of Hayfield. Uh, but, uh, you know, we endured, and uh, lessons in life. There's always love. There's no question about that. Uh, but mother also suffered from schizophrenia all her, all her life, all till, till her last years, 94 years old. And, and while certainly the, the, the drugs certainly helped a lot, thank goodness they were there, uh, there was always those episodes. Every year we'd get into uh, another episode, and, of course, by that time we'd kind of learn how to deal with it, and it, it, uh, it was just more of an inconvenience than a, than a, than a crisis. But... Uh, but I more recently have spent uh, a lot of time during our break, uh, three days in fact, uh, in Rochester uh, in three different facilities that deal with mental illness, uh, trying to get the length and the breadth of it, at least in my community. But I know that I know what I saw there is, is very similar to what we see all over Minnesota. And that is basically, we don't, we don't have the facilities, we don't have the infrastructure that's able to really effectively deal with these kind of patients. And there's a lot of good efforts but it's still not there. And uh, what we're going to do is try to make that happen in the capital bonding bill. Well, and your committee is capital investments right. rather than health and human services. Right. You said yesterday that you can't build the services, but you can build the structures. You're, you've talked a little bit about the message that you're trying to send. Is this related perhaps to a legacy that you want to leave? Because you experienced mental illness growing up and you see the, pro the, the problems. You're calling it a crisis. Is this something you really want to try to help fix? Well, certainly I want to help, and I'll, I'll never leave a legacy. I don't have a question about that. But, but yeah, I think I, I, somehow I do feel I'm called to do this. Uh, if not me, who? And it just seemed to me that... Uh, given my life experience that, uh, and, and a lot of people don't want to talk about this, you know, and, uh, and so I decided, okay, I'm going to start talking about it and I'm going to carry my life experience into, into some legislation and, uh, and hopefully help people along the way. And so as a capital investment committee, yes, we build things. I, I can't provide all the professional services that, that also are needed to make a, an effective treatment system work. But we can start at least by forcing the, the issue, forcing the conversation, at the building level, and by the way, I hope I hope to move these forward uh, in terms of uh, uh, the building uh, of the, what we call crisis centers across Minnesota initially, and then some behavioral health centers uh, as well. So uh, I have I happen to believe that if if we build them, we will find staff for them. We need to. It's that critical. We're not going to we're not going to build to an empty building. That building is going to be full of staff and it's going to be uh, made available for patients that need them. And 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 by the way, more than likely. It's as many as we build are going to be overwhelmed almost immediately. Well, and so this goes to a little bit towards the Unlocking Opportunities grant program that you created. There seems to be a correlation between mental health and incarceration. Can the state of Minnesota ever get ahead of these problems, do you think? Well, uh, one, one would hope, but uh, we can't sit on our hands. We, we have to step up and we need to, need, need to deal with it. Now, now this, this program you're just talking about has to do with prisoners coming out of our state prisons, about over 8,000 a year. Uh, double felonies in almost every, every case. Uh, not, not, not every case, but at least as far as this program, that's who, it would, that's who it would touch. 
And, uh, you know, those people have little chance of doing anything other than returning to prison unless we do something. And that's really expensive. You know, $35,000 a year to keep somebody in prison. Can't we step up to some level and give them the support structure that they need uh, to assimilate within the community, to get a job, have a house, have a roof over their head, and uh, be part of a productive society? And, and I think they can. We just need to give them a head start. Well, and in the bill, it refers to these individuals as locked out individuals. So what are some of the challenges that they face? If you've been in prison and you're getting out, what are some of the challenges that you're facing that this grant program would help to alleviate? Well, for, for, for you know, as, as you leave that prison door, and of course I have never done this, but uh, as you do, uh, you probably get a bus ticket or something like this, and where are you going to, you come to Rochester, Minnesota, you're going to get off, and where are you going to go? There's nowhere. Uh, uh, this will provide a, a local support structure, uh, find you a place to live, uh, begin to, again, teach you uh, life skills relative to being on the outside, uh, provide you at least, an, assist you in an employment search, and so on and so forth. But, but just to bring you back into society and, 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 and make you a productive part of society. That's, you know, returning 62% to prison as we do currently is, is is not a good investment of our of our time or our money. We so better do is, better than this. This is meant to really tackle the recidivism rate. Exactly. Right. So in addition to providing housing for these individuals, the program would also require that services, as you mentioned, job yeah. placement, training, health care, parenting. Are those factors that contribute then to people having to return that they just don't have a way to live? They don't know how to live when they well, get out? Yeah, yeah, to some great degree, that's what we hear at least. And uh, so you know, we, we've, got to, we've got to create initiative in their heart, there's no question about that, that uh, be able to provide some level of, of infrastructure support, I'm talking about human infrastructure, and, and again, a, a roof over your head. That, that's kind of what they need, and, and a little bit of monitoring and encouragement, and hopefully uh, that 62% uh, will, will lower and, and we'll be better off as society for it. Did this unlocking opportunities, did it make it into the omnibus? It's not in there yet, but it, the session's not over with it. Session's yet, so, not over. Uh, Senator Senjum, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thank you very much.